Now there was a disciple of Damascus at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. For some days, he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him, but their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him, but his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples, and they were all afraid of him, and they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, but they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. Well, good morning, church. We are in Acts 9 that has one of the most famous of all conversion stories, the story of Saul, whose name will ultimately be Paul. We know him as the Apostle Paul. Remember last week, uh, we kind of reviewed his conversion as he's on the road to Damascus. Here's this man, he is a rabbi. He is a young member of the Sanhedrin, the, the governing body of the nation of Israel, the religious leaders anyway. He's a Pharisee. He has a vote, he has power over people's lives. As they were blasphemers, he could have them imprisoned, he could have them help the vote to have them executed. He's a, a rising star, he's a top student, he's underneath a leading rabbi, Gamaliel, that's his heritage. He's empowered by the Sanhedrin, he's given extradition orders, he's going to cities around the Mediterranean world and he's arresting Christians. Hellenistic Jews, Jews who had a, a Greek or Gentile type of, of heritage, and he's dragging them back to Jerusalem to stand trial where they were imprisoned, beaten, or, or killed. Uh, he is not a good guy by our standards, but by their standards, he is a very righteous man, right? And he's on his way to Damascus with these extradition orders. He's pursuing Jews who had fled Jerusalem because of the persecution that he led after the martyrdom of Stephen. 
And on that road, just outside the city of Damascus, he is struck by a bright light. And in that light, he sees Jesus and Jesus appears and begins to speak to him. And in a moment, Saul's life is just upended. He realizes that Jesus is alive. He realizes that Jesus is the Messiah. He realizes that his compatriots on the Sanhedrin had executed the promised Messiah that they had been looking for for centuries. And he's devastated. He spends three days in a dark room, right? And we looked at that conversion story and we noted that true conversion stories, every true conversion story, right? Let me see, there we go. Glorifies our Savior's uh, sovereign grace and overwhelming love. Every conversion story does this. Regardless of the elements, the, you know, the Saul's conversion story has great emotion attached to it. You can imagine the emotional uh, reaction and the roller coaster that he was on for three days sitting in that dark room, right? As he's reliving his entire life and all the things that he has done in the name of God, he has killed people who he now realizes were innocent. Think about his emotions and just everything that's going on in this man for three days as he's in this room all by himself. He's physically blind. He's not eating. He's not drinking. And the light bulbs are just going off. He's spiritually blind, but spiritually he's beginning to see. And so he has all this vivid, I mean, this is a vivid conversion story. Lots of emotion attached to it. And some of you, you can relate to that, but many of us cannot because our conversion stories are not filled with vivid emotions and events and trauma or you know, lights going off and you know, fireworks and the, the feeling of the burden of sin being lifted and freedom from addictions. And oh, that's not our story because we were five, <laughs> you know, or seven, or we're third or fourth or fifth generation Christians and or whatever, right? All of our stories are different, but all of our stories have common elements. And we kind of looked at that last week. No matter, no matter the details of our stories, every conversion story has common elements. The planting of gospel seeds, and you saw this, we looked at that in Saul's life, how before the road of Damascus, seeds of the gospel were already being planted in his life. And the same is true with every one of us. Before we ever trust in Christ, somebody has been planting gospel seeds, the pursuit of our loving Lord, that Jesus pursues us and he convicts us and he begins to work in our life and he's, he's relentless, right? He's relentless. And our system of belief is called irresistible grace. You know, he just keeps coming and coming and coming. And why does he do that? Because before the foundations of the world, God made a decision to put his saving grace upon us. And he did this not because of our good works, not because we deserved it in any way, because all of us are born sinners. We're dead in our trespasses and sins, but God in his rich mercy, because of his mercy and according to good pleasure of his will, he gives us a new heart. And when he gives us that new heart, we are now able to, at the time when he gives us faith and the desire to repent, when that happens, when he gives us that grace, we now have a heart that wants to respond and we do respond. And on that day, that promised day of response and salvation, we make that decision and we do so willingly, freely, but the reason why is because God has done all this work in our lives, giving us this heart that's now capable of, of actually believing the truth of the gospel. And Jesus, that wonderful passage in John 6, every person that God has given to me, that the Father has given to me, will come to me, and I won't lose one single person. Every single one. What a beautiful truth of the gospel. That when God has put his saving grace upon you before we were even in the womb, your eternal destiny is established and set. You cannot screw it up, brother and sister. Isn't that wonderful? Because I'm, I'm pretty capable of messing everything up, but I can't mess this up. Praise the Lord, right? Everything else is fair game, but not this, you know? How awesome is that? And then we, find, we closed out with just kind of noting the personal nature of each encounter. We don't inherit our Christianity. Young people, listen to me. You're raised in a Christian home, but you yourself must become convinced of this truth, that you are a sinner without hope 
apart from Jesus Christ. And you have to believe that in the core of your being and that your only hope is Jesus. And if you'll throw yourself upon his mercy and call out upon him and commit your life to him as Lord and Savior, he'll save you. You have to have that. You cannot rely upon your parents. It doesn't work that way. It's not an inheritance. Eternal life is not a spiritual inheritance like a bank account is a physical inheritance. It has to be a personal encounter that you have with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as I was thinking about that and meditating on these elements this week and preparing the message, um, I found my heart and my spirit just being affected. When you think about it, when you meditate on it, is your, is your heart affected? Is your spirit affected? I know when I, when, I, when I typed out the planting of gospel seeds, I just stopped right there and my mind was just flooded. And, and where it went for me was with my mom. And my mind was just flooded with memories of all the ways that my mom planted gospel seeds. I remember, I think I must have been three or four maybe. And we found this beautiful butterfly and it was dead. <laughs> but it was still, it just had died. And she pulled out that butterfly and she, we looked at, and she talked about how beautiful the butterfly was and God, the creator of beauty, but it had died. And why did it die? Because of sin. And sin brings death and we all die. I mean, I, I was pre-K. And that memory came flooded back and other memories. And I just sat there and, I, and I'll be honest with you, maybe I'm just getting become more of a marshmallow as I get older, but I started kind of tearing up, right? But I had to stop and I had to just thank God. I mean, she's, she's been gone for a number of years, but I had to just thank God that I had a godly mama who planted seeds of the gospel in my life. Guys, call your mama after church and tell her you love her, okay? That's your Phoebe right there. I think of all the people that God has put into my life at critical times to show me what the gospel means and what grace is. And I'm just overwhelmed by it. It, it humbles me. It encourages me. It, it shows me that God is at work in my life, that he's doing something that is much bigger than me, right? It humbles me. It, it encourages me. It motivates me. It, it, it makes me, uh, me want to sing. It motivates worship. I had no problem singing this morning. Worthy, worthy. Wow. Every song this morning was right on target. Is it because every song was just great? No, it's because when you meditate upon these truths, every song packs and brings is gonna resonate. Guarantee it, right? Every song will resonate. And so sometimes I find myself wanting to sing and sometimes I find myself wanting to shout almost like Christy, not quite. And sometimes I find myself wanting to cry and sometimes I find myself wanting to do all three at the same time, right? I kind of get why Saul might have been an emotional basket case in that room, right? Um, when you meditate on these common elements, does it do some, Does it stir your heart? Does it affect you spiritually? You know, if it doesn't, man, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. We should talk. We should talk. Well, this morning, we're going to finish out the, the conversion of Saul with a second gospel application. It's our takeaway truth this morning. It comes from the rest of this passage. Andrea read it for us. We all need a church of brothers and sisters to welcome, nurture, encourage, and protect us as we become the person God intends. If you ever wonder whether the Bible is true, I think you can look at stories like this one and the reaction of Ananias and say, yeah, these are accurate historical accounts. These aren't fables because fables gloss over the human reactions that people would normally have. Fables make people look heroic. The Bible doesn't do that. And you see this here with Ananias in verses 13 and 14. He receives God's instructions. I want you to go to the straight road. There's a man in a room there having a meltdown by the name of Saul. That's in the Greek. And I want you to do these things. And Ananias' reaction, Lord, 
I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Do you get what he's saying here? Uh, Lord, I don't want to. <laughs> this guy's scary. He can arrest me and take me to jail. What if this is a sting operation, right? This could be one of those NBC, you know, dateline things. And Peter is going to come around the corner with the camera and I'm carted off to jail. I mean, that's what could be going on. I don't want to do this, Lord. I mean, stop and ponder this for a moment, right? This is a pivotal point in redemptive history. By obeying God, Ananias is participating in a pivotal moment in redemptive history. Now, now he did not know it at the time, right? Now, he's in heaven now. I bet you he understands now what a big deal his obedience was at the time. But at the time, he had no idea how big a deal this was. But he obeys and he goes and Saul in this room has his Damascus road experience, his conversion ratified, verified. And he's baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He's baptized. He receives his physical sight all because Ananias now obeys. But it wasn't just the obedience of Ananias that's so pivotal here. It's how he obeys. And I think that's what we need to, to make sure that we highlight this here for a moment. And laying his hands on him, Ananias said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has sent me. Now can, consider from Saul's perspective what Ananias' actions and words would have meant to him. Okay? Here's Saul sitting in this room. He's blind. He's helpless. In the dark. Confused. I think it's fair to say a little bit of a basket case, up and down, all over the place, right? Ananias comes in, a stranger, and he lays his hands on him. Not in violence. Not in vengeance, right? Not in retaliation, but in love, in comfort, in compassion, and acceptance. This man, this persecutor, this murderer, this scourge of early Christianity, Ananias doesn't recoil from him with contempt and disdain. All right, let me get this over with, right? And instead, he touches him and he blesses him. I mean, think about what this meant to Saul. He's sitting in this room and he's thinking, my, where do I go now? Everything in my life is over, right? And, and, and at this point, for three days, his life is over, right? He has lost, his, his career path is done. He's done as a rabbi, Pharisee, right? It's done. His career trajectory was plummeted. There's no recovering from this. He's done as a Pharisee, as a member of the Sanhedrin. All of his social connections, done. He's a pariah. He's now a blasphemer. He's in the class of the people who he was arresting and approving of their execution. That's where he now resides. He doesn't even have a way to make a dollar to pay his rent. His life is drastically different. Where does he do, go? What does he do? Who does he turn to for support? He has nothing. Maybe he's a paycheck, but maybe he's got some savings, but Homelessness, who knows what's on his horizon? Ananias says, brother Saul. There's the answer. He has a new family, right? Saul's welcomed into this church family in Damascus. And for the next three years, this church will provide biblical community for him. They will provide the fellowship, the encouragement, the nurturing, and the protection that Saul needs as God begins to transform him into the apostle Paul. It says in verse 19, for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in a synagogue saying, he is the son of God. And all who heard him were amazed. Verse 22 says, but his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. 
Some days, many days. You read those passages and you think, well, what happened here is Saul, he is so filled with zeal that he immediately goes out and he preaches for a couple of weeks and he's so effective that the Jews in the synagogue get mad at him and they try to kill him and then he runs back to Jerusalem. That's not what happens. Galatians chapter one, we read verses uh, 13 to, to 16 or 18 or 14 to 18 last week or 14 to 15, whatever, where, where, where Saul's telling his story to the Galatians. And he says, remember, I was chosen by God before I was ever in the womb to be a, an apostle to the Gentiles. Remember those verses, right? And he said, and then he, he showed me Jesus. Then he goes on to say, and for three years, I was in Damascus and in the Arabian desert. So, so for three years, the Arabian, when we think of the Arabian, we think of Saudi Arabia, right? We think of the nation way down in the Gulf. But, but the Arabian wilderness went, goes, is a big crescent shape. And the northwest edge of this wilderness is right outside Damascus. So in other words, for three years, Saul is in this region. Think about it. Jesus spent three years teaching and mentoring the apostles. And now Saul, Paul, has three years, he says, with Jesus in the wilderness, being taught by him through the Holy Spirit, being instructed, understanding how the Old Testament connects like he did with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. But he's, he's, he's here in the, the region of Damascus and, a, and he goes in and out and he's ministering and he's preaching and he's teaching and, and he's so effective that he ends up having disciples and he wins people to Christ. And you see these disciples learning from him and ultimately helping him when his life was in death. So he has a ministry here for three years and this area, Saul begins to become the guy that we know as Paul, the apostle. And this church is a pivotal church because they welcome him in and they encourage him and they nurture him and they ultimately protect him. And then when you see that he travels to Jerusalem, the story kind of repeats itself. In doing so, it kind of, it reiterates how important it is that we all have a church filled with brothers and sisters who welcome us, who encourage and support, nurture and protect us. When he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple, but Barnabas. You get this? He goes back to Jerusalem, and the, now here, the fear is even more than with Ananias. Uh, because they, I mean, some of the, these disciples are like, this is the guy who killed my dad. This is the guy who had my cousins arrested. This is the guy who had my friends arrested. And this is the guy who held the coats and cheered while they were stoning Stephen. This is a bad dude. These kind of people do not change. You can't help these kinds of people, right? I mean, this is going through the, this, they, they don't want nothing to do with this guy, right? But... Barnabas. What great words. There was a brother in the church of Jerusalem. Barnabas, we saw him at the end of chapter four, just a little brief blurb. I think, I think, I think Luke was setting us up at the end of chapter four for this right here. Because at the end of chapter four, he's called Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Barnabas, the son of encouragement comes to Saul and he hears his story and he believes him, and he brings him to the apostles. And then God takes that relationship between Saul and Barnabas, and we're gonna see in a couple of chapters how he'll use that relationship to begin to spread the kingdom throughout the known Gentile world right there. But again, showing how important it is, how we all need a church of brothers and sisters who welcome us, nurture, courage, protect us as we become the person God intends. We all need this. All right, so what? Say it with me. So what? Come on, wake up. One more time, ready? So right. How does this apply to us? As individuals, I think there's some clear application, but I also think there's some application for us as a church this morning. I want us to do both. Let's start at the personal level. You may be someone here this morning 
that needs to be welcomed. You're here either physically or online, and the reason why is because perhaps you have a lot of questions in your life. Things are going on in your life. You're not where you want to be. You know there's something wrong. Maybe you have questions about God. Maybe you had a, a Christian upbringing and you walked away, but life is not where, it's not turning out how you wanted it to turn out. And you're wondering if you need God in your life. Or maybe you've come and you've made a, a royal mess of your life. I want you to know you've come to the right church. There's a lot of people, a lot of us, who've made royal messes of our lives. And we're not gonna reject you. And we're glad that you're here. And you can come with your questions. And you're not gonna scare us with your questions. And you're not gonna scare us because your life isn't put together. Because the reality is none of us have our lives put together. We all have our junk. And so we're glad you're here with us and we want to help you. Maybe you're here and you need to be welcomed. You're, you're a Christian and you are looking for a church. We hope you land with us. We hope that you believe in the mission and the vision of our church and you come and you embrace it and you bring your gifts and your passion and you help us grow the kingdom of God here and around the world. That you're a blessing to our church and that we are a blessing to you. Now, come, I want to meet you. We want to hear your story. We want to find out, are we the church for you? And, and here's our promise to you. If we're not the church for you, we know other great churches in the area and what God's doing in their church. And, and we'll try to help you land where God wants you to be, okay? We're not competing with other great churches. We want you to be where God wants you to be. A lot of you have been here for years and years and years. You're members. And how does this apply to you? And so here's what I would ask you this morning. Are you committed to being a brother or sister in Christ in the family of God who welcomes, nurtures, encourages, and protects your other brothers and sisters in Christ? Are you committed to that? Are you engaged in that? Or are you kind of on the fringes? And if you wonder, are you really committed? And when I say, are you committed? Not in theory. I mean, are you? <laughs> and, and the way you know whether it's theory versus reality is to ask yourself uh, some simple questions. Are there people in our church family? Do you have relationships with people in our church family, for example, that they would feel safe coming to you if say they were having a marital problem and they wanted somebody to pray with them. Are there people in, guys, are there some guys in your small group that you are walking with that, that you have a relationship with or guys in our church that you have a relationship with that if they, if they fall on a Friday night, they would feel comfortable talking to you over breakfast and saying, hey man, I need you to pray for me. I need you to hold me accountable. I, I'm struggling right now with fill in the blank. Do, 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 you, do you have that kind of relationship with some guys in the church, ladies with some gals in the church? In your small group, those of you who are in discipleship groups, male, female, covenant groups, triads, whatever form of discipleship group that it looks like, is the, the, the environment of your small group such that people feel safe to bring whatever the burden is in their life and not just their spleen that's hurting them. I mean, I'm talking about the stuff that they're struggling with. Maybe the questions that they even have about God or the, the, the problems that they're having with their Christian walk and they feel comfortable bringing it to the group or to people in the group and saying, I need help, I need prayer. I don't know what to do with this. Do they, do they feel safe doing that? Does that happen in your group? That will tell you whether or not it's lip service in theory versus reality. If you don't have that, here's the solution. The way you get this in your discipleship groups, the way you get this in your life, the way you get this in your relationships, the way you get past just talking about the football game, the baseball game, or whatever it is, the way you get past that surface stuff to get to the level where we are truly brothers and sisters who are nurturing and encouraging and protecting and welcoming each other to be authentic and real, the way that happens, here's how it happens. You set the example. 
Set the example. We start with ourselves. And if I want to see my relationships be authentic and real, I have to be willing to start with myself and confess and ask for prayer and ask for help and be real about where I'm at. Good, bad, and the ugly. It's my favorite Clint Eastwood movie and it describes my Christian life. It's the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? But that's how you start. I read a great article this week. I think it was this week. Maybe it might've been last week. And this is really gonna help some of you. It helped me. Because some of you right now are thinking, yeah, Jerry, it's not hard for you to set the example. You're an extrovert, okay? You just bleh. You have no filter, right? It's harder for others of us. And, and the article was basically this. This was the byline, essentially, of the article. Stop using your personality type as justification for your sin. And for hiding. And not living authentically. And being transparent with one another. And he went on to say, you know, whether it's the Enneagram or the Myers-Briggs or whatever, you can say, I'm an extrovert, I'm an introvert, it doesn't matter. The scriptures call us to live authentically and transparently with one another. The scriptures call us to welcome and to be hospitable. And yes, it's uncomfortable, as uncomfortable as it was for Jesus when he climbed on the cross. But do you think that the 12 apostles were all extroverts? Have you not looked at Thomas? He was an ancient engineer, guarantee it. (laughs) Guarantee it, right? God uses all personality types and we don't have the right to use our personality type as a crutch to not engage in these things. I've also done a lot of thinking about this at the corporate level. as a church leader. When we think of the church corporately, it's very easy for churches to turn away people, repel people, instead of being welcoming. It's very easy for church ministries to wound instead of nurture, encourage and protect them. I've I've been guilty of this myself. I mean, I've been a pastor for a few decades and I've, I've blown it big time. Sometimes it was completely unintentional. Sometimes it was a result of my own sinfulness. I did a lot of meditating on this over the last two, three weeks. And I started thinking, why does this happen in churches? What are the obstacles that happen in a church? And what do we need to be on guard in our own church? What do we need to maybe address in our own church so that we are welcoming and nurturing and encouraging? And here's some of the, I came up with three big ones. First one is sin, Right? And particularly sin that is a pervasive characteristic sin in a local church. And sometimes this can happen in particular churches. And And when a particular kind of sin becomes associated with a church, it ends up repelling outsiders. They outside those who are not Christians who are maybe even thinking about coming into faith when they think about that church, any church other than that church. And I'll go to that, but not that church because there is something associated with that church that is sin. And it, it repels outsiders and it becomes toxic to those who are inside the church. So, so for some examples, spiritual arrogance, doctrinal pride, Racism, right? Conservative churches in the South for decades. Pervasive sin has hurt the kingdom of God and the cause of the gospel. Racism, it's there, can't deny it. A a big one, the last few years, and again, plaguing conservative Bible-believing churches. It's become so prevalent across our country that we're losing the next generation because of it. It's Christian nationalism. And you've heard me warn you and caution you and exhort you and are the allegiances of our hearts. You see, when, when we equate the importance of making America great again with the gospel of Jesus Christ, or we equate the Democratic Party with 
the love of Jesus Christ. And we, we associate that in any way, shape, or form, we are going to repel those who need the gospel of Jesus Christ. And when our allegiance is to any form of a political movement or national pride or patriotism, and our allegiance to that is equal to or greater than our love and allegiance and zeal and passion for the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are idolaters. And we are hurting the cause of Christ. And sin, that sin gets tacked on to the church that you're a part of. So I am begging you on your social media, understand that every post you make to any person who is not a Christian or any person who is seeking help, when they look at your social media post, it is automatically gonna be associated with covenant church and the gospel and the kingdom of God. Think about that before you hit post. Our citizenship is first in heaven, brothers and sisters. This nation will pass away at some point. The kingdom of God stands forever. That's our citizenship, first and foremost. Say amen or oh me, one of the two. Amen. Okay. Next, system failures. I'm running out of time. What I mean by this is ministries, programs of the church. In other words, I'm gonna say it, move on. Our ministries, when we don't show up and volunteer with joy and enthusiasm, and we just beg off, there's consequences. You guys out in the parking lot, especially right now with all that's going out there, God bless you, okay? You say more about our church in the first 10 minutes of people being on our campus than what I can say. When people come to our church, you have already said all that we can say about being welcoming or not. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All of you who are going the extra mile right now, and all of you who show up at nursery to love on a little baby, so that a mom who's maybe wore out can come in and just rest and enjoy the service, understand you're not just doing your duty, you are welcoming and nurturing, nourishing and encouraging someone so that they can become who God wants them to be and intends them to be. That's what's going on here, all right? And when we don't fill this in right, when in our small groups, we don't love and support one another and somebody's going through a major crisis and we ignore it, there's huge consequences to that. Huge consequences. This next one, we're, I've got to say something about this. Spiritual formation that's not equally grounded in the grace and truth of the gospel and the person of the Holy Spirit hinders those we seek to help. Let me just say it like this. Churches, especially Bible-believing churches and conservative evangelical churches, will oftentimes overemphasize either the grace of the gospel or the truth of the gospel at the expense of the other. So Jesus was full of grace and truth, right? And churches can oftentimes be so strong on the truth that they sacrifice the grace of the gospel and they wound and they hurt the people who need to be welcomed and need to have an environment where they can feel comfortable to bring out what's going on in their lives. A biblical church, a good church, a godly church is gonna have a balance between grace and truth and ministries are gonna recognize that spiritual formation doesn't happen through some mechanistic manner. It, it happens at the timing and through the presence of the Holy Spirit. People don't just change like that. The desires that are in a person's heart and the sin that may be there, that are, they, don't, they don't just disappear it can take time, it can take years, it can take a lifetime. That's why Paxton came up here the other, uh, last week and was talking about recovery ministry and is talking about fighting addiction. Some of the testimonies, people, 30 years, 40 years, 
fighting alcoholism. This is part of their sanctification. It's naive to say that you can just pray it away. That doesn't always happen. We have to think about this. Where is this really going to become real? In our culture, in our church, it's already real. It's going to say a lot about who we are as a church and whether or not God's going to use us in the next many years. People who have the brokenness of addiction, family issues, abuse, people who are trying to recover from sexual abuse of different kinds, domestic abuse, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, people who are having sexual desires that don't fall within the norms historically. 8% of the American culture right now identifies in some way or another with LGBTQ. Does the gospel just write off people who have those desires? Does the church just write that off? Or is the church supposed to be a place that welcomes, nourishes, encourages, and protects the young man, the young woman, who says, I have these desires, I have these thoughts, I don't understand why, what do I do? How do I handle this? I want to follow Jesus, but I'm not attracted to boys. I'm not attracted to girls. I don't feel like a girl. And I don't understand why. Are we going to be a church that welcomes them? Are we going to be a church that sticks our heads in the sand and just screams truth about the biblical ideal of marriage between a man and a woman? Or are we going to come at it with grace and truth? Our denomination is struggling with this right now. At the General Assembly last summer, overtures were passed that was establishing that men who have, who struggle with same-sex attraction, that this automatically disqualifies them from the office of elder or deacon, um, unless they meet certain criteria. Um, the, the original overtures were as, about as homophobic as you could have. They were amended, but even what was written made it very clear that unless a man who was same-sex attracted would agree that over time those desires were basically disappearing, then he could not be an elder or a deacon in the Presbyterian Church in America. Those overtures passed at the General Assembly. Even though several of our elders and, and pastors, some of whom are married, have children, we, uh, we wrote, a, wrote, wrote a phenomenal report on human sexuality. Our denomination released a phenomenal report. Two of the men who wrote that report have been married for 30, 40 years, have children, grandchildren, and will tell you that they have struggled with same-sex attraction their entire lives. They have to kill it every day. They don't understand why they have that attraction. They understand that being a follower of Jesus Christ means that they don't give in to that desire. They have to crucify the flesh and take up the cross and follow him. And other elders, they take a life of celibacy. They, they don't marry. And they recognize what the Bible says about marriage being between a, a man and a woman husband, wife, biologically. They understand what the scriptures teach and they crucify the flesh daily. And our denomination passed overtures saying those man, men can't be elders 
those overtures went to the presbyteries and I just want you to know that when the overtures come to presbyteries, a certain number of presbyteries have to pass them, then it goes back to the General Assembly, and if they, it is passed again, it becomes part of the Constitution laws of our denomination. I just want you to know when it came to our presbytery, I want you to know I, I'm not ashamed of this. I stood up, I spoke against those overtures. I believe these overtures are wrong. It is getting the balance of grace and truth wrong. You see, any approach that says anybody who's created in the image of God, who is struggling against sin and is trying to figure it out and is being transparent and honest and wants to follow Jesus and wants to deal with this in a way that whatever it is that they're struggling with and wants to deal with it in a way that honors Jesus for us in any way, shape or form to put obstacles in their way that's just not gospel, folks. That's not Jesus at the well with the Samaritan woman who was an adulteress. Not at all. Okay, that's, that's the people in Jerusalem who didn't want anything to do with Saul, the persecutor. Okay? So we go down that road you should just disqualify me because I'm 55 years old. I've been married for 32 years. I love my wife. I think she's pretty hot. <laughs> but does that mean I never have looked at a woman ever again and lust? Well, you still lust, Jerry. You're not qualified to be an elder. Or does it mean that I'm supposed to fight that sin and crucify that sin, kill that sin. Does that mean when Paxson, I'm gonna pick on you Paxson, okay, I'm sorry. When Paxson might have an urge to drink and he still has an urge to drink, well, you still have an urge to drink. You can't be an elder, Paxson, sorry. You clearly are not being sanctified by the Holy Spirit because you still have that desire. Is that the gospel? See, there's a third way for our, our brothers and sisters who are struggling with this. The third way is, I know what the scriptures say, and my allegiance is to Jesus, and I don't know how it's going to play out in my life, ultimately, but I'm going to obey what Jesus says, and I'm going to follow him, and I'm going to trust him, and he's going to have the allegiance of my heart first, not what the culture says about my sexuality. Not what I say about myself, it's what Jesus says. But in order for that person to be successful, they have got to have a church that welcomes them and encourages them and nurtures them and loves them and puts their arms around them and says, yeah, this is really hard. It's really hard sometimes. We have an elder in our presbytery who's been same-sex attracted that he would say since he was 10 years old, he's married, has two kids, and he says it is so hard. Loves his wife, loves his children, but he still has that attraction. And he kills it, he fights against it, he falls upon the grace of God, he brings it into his life. Thank God he's in a church that doesn't sacrifice grace for truth. We need grace and truth. And that's the kind of church we wanna be. Why? Because this takeaway truth, <laughs> guys, this is in the DNA of our church. This is the mission of our church. If we're bringing gospel restoration to people's deepest needs, this means that they are going to ultimately become the person God intends. This takeaway truth is in four of our six church values living authentically and connecting intentionally and caring genuinely for one another and proclaiming the truth graciously. It's in one of our critical questions we ask ourselves, where do you go to safely ask the hard questions so that you will not be condemned? Where is that? 
This is part of the DNA of our church, this takeaway truth. And why? Because this is what every one of us experienced when we came to Jesus. This is part of the gospel. This is the core bedrock of the gospel. We come to Jesus with all of our junk and it's ugly because sin is ugly. And the consequences of sin and creation, I don't understand why I have these desires. And you don't understand why you have these desires. But sin has so affected our creation and our world and us as individuals. And so we struggle with things differently. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will welcome you. I will nurture you, I will encourage you, I will protect you. How will I do this? Through my church, through brothers and sisters who are receiving the exact same thing. God, for help us. If we ever forget this, that this is who we're supposed to be. This is why we are here, Covenant Church. That's why we're here. Lord Jesus, help us to be that kind of church. Help us to be that kind of church. It's so hard. Lord, I, I, first of all, I just want to bring it to the personal level. I pray for every person in this church right now, whatever the struggle, Lord, whatever the struggle, it can be addictions. It can be marriages that are falling apart. It can be sexual identity and confusion about where, where a person's at or desires they're struggling with. It can be any number of idolatries. It can be gluttony, greed, and covetousness, and high anxiety and fear and worry and pride and spiritual. Lord, there's just so much. None of us has the right to be proud this morning. We all need your grace. Lord Jesus, for everyone who is struggling this morning, who needs to be welcomed, encouraged, nurtured, would they find, find what they need here at Covenant? Lord, help them to give us grace when we fail. We will fail. Sometimes it'll just be well-intentioned failure. We, we won't know exactly what to say at the right time and we'll put our foot in our mouth. Help us to be humble and apologize and help the person who we hurt to forgive us. But Lord, help us to get it right more than we get it wrong. Most importantly, help our hearts to be in the right place. May that aroma just permeate this church so that the person who walks through the doors senses this about our church. Would you do that work of grace in us, Lord Jesus? In your name I pray, amen.